This is CouncilCast, part of the Legal Talk Network, and I'm your host, Karen Conroy. When you face a complex case outside your expertise, you bring in a co-counsel for next-level results. When you want to engage, expand, and elevate your firm, you bring in a marketing co-counsel. In this podcast, I bring in marketing experts who each answer one big question to help your firm achieve more. Here's today's guest. I'm Robert Ingalls, founder of Law Pods, and I'm also a recovering attorney. And at Law Pods, me and my team produce world-class podcasts for some of the largest law firms in the world. And it's been a really interesting journey going from trial lawyer to being a marketing, uh, a legal marketing person for lawyers. So I want to start there. So thank you for being here, Robert. I know this is going to be a great conversation because we have a lot to cover today. But let's start with this idea of um, I've now been doing this through the previous recession and now the pandemic. And I've seen this journey that some attorneys take (laughs) when they kind of have this moment based on economic issues that I'm going to I'm going to try marketing. So how did you how did that happen? How did that start? Kind of, how did you make that journey? For, like, how, how did I end up sitting here in front of this microphone instead of in court? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it really started, uh, I feel like a lot of things in life are hard to trace back to a moment. Yes. But I can really trace this back to six words, and they are, I want to have a baby. Oh, okay. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and what made that... Uh, kind of earth shaking for me was I had been only been married for a few months. And when we got married, the conversation had been, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Yeah. And so getting this information just a few months in was, it shook me a little bit. And I, yeah. I kind of was like, what, when? And, and now? she was like, now, <laughs> now. Yeah. yeah. Like I've been taking my temperature. I think now's good. Right. Yeah. That kind of now. Yeah. And it, it really forced me to take stock of my situation and my situation was not good. Yeah. It was my mental health was in shambles. Yeah. And when you're used to living like that, you sometimes, you know, you can normalize anything, right? Sure. Sure. And, but then I started thinking like I was barely hanging on. Yeah. And I started thinking, wait, somebody's going to live here next year. Yeah. And I'm going to be their primary mentor. That's going to, and so I started thinking about, I've got to keep this going. I've got to keep working all these hours and not making any money. And because I hadn't figured out that piece of it yet. Yeah. And I was just super overwhelmed in the law. Me and the law weren't compatible yeah. for, for my mental health. And so I'm, I was really overwhelmed in the idea that I was going to add one more big thing yeah. on top of that just kind of broke me. Sure. And... After I had a, a proper freak out, mostly unbeknownst to my wife, <laughs> I, I sat down and I made a list. And at the top of that list was money. I've got yeah. to figure this money thing out because this is not going to work. I didn't, I, I was feeling like, oh, I, I don't know if I can keep being a lawyer, but what else am I going to do? I've got to, I've right. got to figure that out or I got to yeah. lean into this and figure it out. Money. Yeah. And so I... You know, like most things in life, I just got a book about money. How do I figure this money? I got to get more money. How do I get more money? Yeah. And the, it was a very good book. I, I, I enjoyed it. I was also running a small law office at the time, and the author had a leadership book. So I said, well, that's perfect. I'll listen to this leadership book as well. And the leadership book at the very end said, you should listen to our podcast. And at that point in time, this nice. is September 15. I've never listened to a podcast before. And September 15 of what year? September 2015. Oh, September of 2015. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd never listened to a podcast. And I just, I opened the app. I clicked on the podcast. I listened to the episode. It wasn't a perfect fit for me, but I was already yeah. in the app. And I just searched, I think something about like office culture or something, yeah. something similar to what I just listened to. And this show came up, it was called Awesome Office. And it had just started. It had just a handful of episodes, so I listened to the first episode, and the guest was Tom Bilyeu, who is founder of Quest Nutrition. I guess he's starting to get kind of famous at this point, and he has his own brand now called Impact Theory, but at the time, he was with Quest Nutrition, and he's just, if, if, if no one's ever listened to him, like this, it's a, it's a, he's a hype man. 
Okay. He will make you believe in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and the takeaway from that show at the end, like to synthesize it down, was the, something we've heard millions of times. You can be anything you want. Nice. And it, it, it sounds so cliche, yeah. but I, I heard it. Yeah. I heard it. Along with everything else, I heard it. And I thought, I, I don't think I'm stuck. I don't think I have to keep doing this. Yeah. And, and it wasn't this moment where I knew what I was going to do. No idea. No idea. And that took a couple of years to even start to believe that this was something I could do. Yeah. But I also was immediately impacted by that medium, by podcasting. Within nice. 30 days, I own this mic I'm talking into. Nice. And I was in my spare bedroom with, with a little tiny mixer and just figuring <laughs> it out. I just fell in love with it. Yeah. And I kept listening to personal development podcasts, which I'd never really been into personal development before. It just wasn't where my mindset was. And I kept playing with it. And I, I sh shortly after that, I was like, I, I don't know if I can keep this law thing going. And I started trying to do lots of different things. And over the period of a couple of years, I'd started a podcast and people in town saw me doing it. Lawyers started asking me to help them and the business was born. Nice. Okay. That is a great intro because there were so many sub parts to that conversation in terms of starting with your mental health. <clears throat> and so I want to back up real quick. And do the intro first and talk about how, what we're going to talk about today. So we are talking ab about podcasts, of course, like that is the big, you know, overarching topic, but the, the actual title of the show is why your firm might need a podcast. And I'm going to emphasize the word might for all of the reasons that you just described. So we're going to dig into podcasting, how it works and, you know, everything that goes into podcasts and, and how they actually can work for your firm. But I do want to start with this idea of you can be anything and also aligning that with your mental health because podcasting is not for the faint of heart. It is a lot of work and it is worse than SEO in terms of that long tail, long term growth strategy. Like you are not going to launch a podcast today and see seven figures of profit from that podcast next week. Like this is just not how it works. So let's, let's start first with where do you start? What if you're thinking you've got a firm, you're kind of at that kind of mid career growth stage, you're doing decent, but you really want to take it to the next level. Where would you recommend that they start? I mean, overall marketing strategy for with a podcast. So if, if we're they thinking, were about, thinking podcasting. about a podcast, yeah, sure. It's, I mean, I would, I would think about my overall strategy and if something like this fits at the end of the yes. day, the podcast is content marketing. Yep. And if, if you have, if you're ready to commit to a content marketing strategy, I think it's one of the best ones yeah. and it, it really can be one of the least time intensive ones, which is one of my favorite things about it. Yeah. And more cost effective ones. Because the thing I love most about podcasting is you can, if you, if, especially if you're working with an agency, you can sit down, plug in your mic, have a conversation, and 20, 30 minutes later, you're done. You're and done. that yeah. is the extent of the work you have to do. Now, you said it a moment ago, it's a lot of work. Yeah. But that work doesn't have to be yours. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's you key. can take that. Yeah, you can take that conversation you had, your agency, or if you have in-house, can take that and they edit it, turn it into a podcast, and now it's on Apple and Spotify and all the places. You yep. put it on your website, you can summarize it with show notes, links, transcripts, but then you can grab the whole video like you're doing right now, take that video, put it on YouTube. Yeah. And then really powerfully, you take that video and you clip it yep. down into smaller parts and make vertical videos, landscape, square, and put them on different social platforms to promote the podcast, but also as content marketing to get yourself yeah. out there. There'd be branding. Yes. And creating, you know, providing value for people. Cause that's a lot of times what the podcast is. You're not saying, Hey, I'm so great. Look at me. I exist. You're saying, what can I help you with? How can yes. I give you something that will kind of endear you to me, create that relationship? Yeah. 
So I want to back up. I'm going to I'm going to reiterate the 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 moment and the point that you made a minute ago saying the work doesn't have to be yours. I would actually come out a little stronger in terms of law firms. If you're at the right stage of growth where a podcast is right for you, the work shouldn't be yours. You don't have time for this. And if it's really right for you, and it then then you you shouldn't be wasting your time editing it and pulling out the social media clips. I mean, because if you are doing that yourself, and I will say, I don't do all of my podcasts, this podcast myself, I couldn't possibly do it. And when I started and I initially sat down and said, okay, I, I think I'm going to do this. I started with a checklist saying, if I'm going to do this, the only way I'm going to do it is the right way. I'm going to recognize that my commitment is max one to two hours a week because and that includes this recording time because i've got i've got work to do (laughs) i've got stuff going on right right and so the only way you can do that legitimately and put it out a great product is if you're not doing it yourself you have to have a team full of people that are supporting it and doing all of that behind the scenes work for you right yeah and i mean that's that's a good point is I've I've known lawyers uh, in my life that do the SEO at their firm, but they don't yeah. practice. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, they this is something they got interested in. They do it, and they usually have an SEO agency too. Yeah, but they're, they're driving very crazy. involved in it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. And but for something like this, I mean, I would agree. Yeah. To to really get the value out of it, I think you need to be at a certain point where you can do it. Yeah. But at the same time, I also having been in a small firm where we did start a podcast. I, I did it myself, not the best use of my time. Yeah. But at the same time, I was one of the first people doing it. There was yeah. almost no law firms that were doing this yet. So I just had content on my website that when somebody went there, they could get basic answers yeah. to the things that they showed up looking for. They had a few questions yeah. and I knew what those questions are. We know what people want to know. Yeah. And I would make those episodes and then clients would say, I really enjoyed that episode. It helped me understand X, Y, Z. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I think, you that's know, a- I would say for, for some people, I think it's worthwhile, even if you're in a small firm, depending sure. on how you get clients yeah. to at least consider having a handful of audio episodes that hit the high points, that hit the big questions. So you have something when somebody comes to you that they can engage with and that will help break down the friction that it takes to get them to pick up the phone. Yeah, I think, so I know um, in part of what you talk about, you talk about starting by figuring out who your audience is. And I think that's really important in how, what you're describing. So starting with, okay, what is what is this podcast? Who am I even talking to right now? So am I, am I starting this podcast because I want to answer some questions? Like I want to turn this into an FAQ part of my website? Or am I talking to the media? Like maybe I'm uh, you know, a certain kind of attorney that I'm trying to elevate myself to get more of a national presence. And so I'm kind of speaking to a certain um, nationally t- trendy topic and in, in the hopes of attracting media attention. Who am I talking to? Because if you're just talking to your potential clients or your current clients or whatever, then I do think you can do it yourself. I think you can kind of sit down and do those recordings yourself and you can throw those together. And maybe it's not even, maybe it's just a static set of recordings, right? And you don't even have to have like an ongoing, um, you know, show. Uh, but right. if you're really trying to elevate to that next level and, and take it out, and grow from that. I don't know. I feel like the other point you made was that when you started, this was a different landscape. Since this pandemic, there are bajillions of podcasts now. And so if you're trying to make a, a, a splash and get any kind of attention, it's not as easy as it was 10 years ago, right? Certainly not. But that is also one of the good things about a law firm podcast, depending on why you're doing it. Yeah. If, if you're doing an FAQ style, I don't think it's really much different yeah. because that style of podcast isn't really competing with podcasting in general. Right. Right. That's, com- you know, that essentially that's competing with, you know, Susan Jones's PI firm down the street. Right. 
And, and that's your competition because it's really just content marketing that is helping set you apart from your competition and provide answers to build that know, like trust. Yeah. And, but then if you are creating something different, because there's a few different reasons people will create a podcast. FAQ is a big one is, let me speak directly to prospects. Then there was, you know, you mentioned one thought leadership. I'm yeah. the first person to talk about the thing. Yes. And and that can start to, I, mean, I think even now in law, there's still so much white space for that kind of podcast. I know there Absolutely. is because I'm working with big firms that are making these. Yeah. And then there is educating referral sources is another big one. Yeah. Is we produce lots of podcasts that speak directly to, you know, there's a comp attorney who does defense work who speaks directly to claims adjusters. Yeah. Because that's where he gets a lot of his referrals. And so he answers the questions they want to know. Nice. And then there's a trial lawyer who makes a podcast specifically for other trial lawyers to come and learn. Nice. And so he's trying to get referrals from those people. He's trying yeah. to build his network. Yeah. That's really unique because um, you are not in the general population of competition at that point because you are really narrowing down who you're trying to reach. And so it seems like it makes that process easier. Well, and, and, and that's the thing a lot of attorneys show up with, I, I don't think the best angle on it is they're, a, they'll show up thinking, I want to make a podcast about something interesting and yeah. I will also be a lawyer. <laughs> and and I, I get that. Yeah. That was my first idea. Right. And so it's I'm very natural. I'm going to talk about my cats, my cats and my plants. And you know, well, people are going to find yeah. this so fascinating. They're going to want to hire me as an attorney. Right. Or, I mean, some of them will think I will make something about another subject. Yes. Any subject, something yes. that might even be interesting. But the problem that you run into is now you're competing. Yes. Yeah. And now you're competing with, especially if it's entertainment, some want to be semi-entertaining. Yeah. And now you're competing with the Joe Rogans of the world and the Brene yeah. Browns of the world. Right. And it's going to be hard when someone has their habit of podcast to, to decide not to listen to something they know and, and to listen to your thing. I'm not saying it's not possible, but no. if you're that good, maybe you should rethink the profession. You know, yes. if you're that good that you can make something like that. Yes. So for the most part, you want to make something at least, especially in the beginning, that's, that has a niche that's yeah. speaking directly to a specific person for a specific reason so yeah. we can get this to turn into money. Yes. Okay. So I think that is, it keeps coming back to this idea that step one is figuring out your audience and your audience is not people who want to hear about your cat. And it's what, it's also like your audience and what do they need from you? Right. And that's kind of what you're describing. Like find out who you're, who you're speaking to and what purpose you're serving to them. So then, right. um, the next question I want to circle, uh, kind of dig into is who should not do this? So if you're kind of having a hard time figuring that audience out or you do a really hold tight to this idea of talking about your cats, who are the, who is this not a great idea for? And kind of coming back to this idea of the title of the show being why your firm might need a podcast, which obviously conversely is asking why it might not um, because I've talked to so many firms who think, Oh, Hey, I listen to your podcast. So maybe I need a podcast too. And I'm like, why, <laughs> what are you going to do with that? <laughs> so, right. so how do you start those conversations and, and what kind of questions do you ask to figure out if it's even a, the right idea for that firm? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'll say before we move on past it is also talk about your cat. Uh, okay. Weave it in yes. real briefly, yeah. but just real briefly, because a big part of having a podcast is being relatable. Sure. And one of the best ways to be relatable is to pepper in little things about yourself that people can relate to and go, oh, I like that. That's, I also play golf and I had a bad cat. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes. So that kind of thing. I but think that's going to make those cat people who, I think that kind of checks the box for people who feel like they need to bring in this, this unique approach, but, um, but recognize the overall strategy here. Like the overall strategy is not to sell cat food, right? The overall right. strategy is what? And then how, maybe you can mention your cat, like you said, to bring in personality right. and make people like you. But at the whole um, kind of expense of talking about this thing that you are gonna serve for them, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, just pepper it in real fast. Yes, yeah. 
when we're thinking, when we're talking to somebody and they're just kicking the tires, hey, is this something that we should do? We want to know a lot about them. What are they doing right now? And that's on our intake form. What kind of marketing are you doing right this second? Yeah. And how are you getting, how do you get most of your clients? And what is your budget? Because if somebody's budget is really small, that's going to make our conversation short, very different. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, it's just, if you're going to, we have positioned ourselves to do really good work that we're thinking about doing long term. Yeah. And, and so that will change the conversation and we, Hey, we have somebody else that we know that you can work with. And so understanding what they're trying to do, how they're getting their clients right now yeah, and what their, what's their long-term strategy look like? Where do they want to be in five years? Where do they want to be in 10 years? What kinds of marketing are they also using to lean into that? Yeah. And, and finding out because we've, I've talked to more than one solo who wants to be a solo forever and it's it's strange how how many times this specific conversation happens and they'll say i already have more work than i can handle yes i hear that multiple times a week as well and and then i mean I, i'm i'm a business person at my very core and i have i really struggle to understand how someone could say i have more work than i can handle but i will never hire someone to help me <laughs> which is fine i get it i get it like that's who you want to be oh. but to me i'm like Opportunity, opportunity. Yes, um, yes. But if that's the position that you find yourself in, I don't, you know, if everything's working and that pipeline of yours isn't going to dry up, like if you're like, right. no, I'm going to have a consistent book of business until I'm done with this whole game, I think just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, I still, I, I hear that argument and I, I hear kind of where you're going, but at the same time that I'm thinking, okay, but nobody except maybe Bill Gates, predicted this pandemic. Nobody predicted, you know, these major kind of forces on the economy that can influence your business. And the best laid plans, right? Uh, Even though you may think today will last forever, the likelihood is that things are going to change outside of your control that you need to somehow have a safety net for, or somehow have some sort of a plan for, right? Like, I just... I don't feel safe in telling people, okay, you just keep doing it. You just keep doing you. You're good. You're going to kind of keep doing this for the next 20 years. And I hope nothing ever changes. Like that's all that ever changes is everything, right? Yeah. (laughs) So, okay. So it may be that you don't need a podcast. If number one, I heard you suggesting that like, if you don't have the budget for it, obviously that's not going to make any sense. Um, but what other situations, and maybe you already have, so number two, you already have more business than you can handle and you have no interest in um, kind of going from there. You're, you're hoping that the economy and, and life kind of stays as is, right? So what are other situations would you say, okay, I don't think this is quite right for you? I mean, one that comes up sometimes is people just don't like doing it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. They will start doing it and they're, they have trouble getting through it. It's like, oh, let me start that again. Oh, let me start. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it ends up being a really bad show because it's got a thousand cuts in it. Yeah. And, and then it's really hard to get them to come back and record more yeah. because it, it, it's one of those things. I mean, I think everybody has things in their life that they put off because they don't like doing it. It becomes right. one of those things. Yep. And if that's a situation, not a good fit. If you're in a small firm, it's it's hard to to solve that. Sure. Because somebody's got to talk, right? Yes. And yeah. there, but in as you get into larger firms, one of the things we'll always ask is, we end up talking to the marketing department a lot first, and we'll say who are, who are who are the people that everyone crowds around at a cocktail party yeah. when there's a networking event. Who's the loudest voice in the room that everyone wants to hear? Yeah. Because we want to identify who our speakers are, who our main hosts are. Yeah. Um, but the people who don't like doing it have been a bad fit for it. Yeah. And I'm picturing. It's, it's very. I'm picturing like being at the hair salon and the person is sitting there saying, "I want my hair to look like this," and I have like ten different um, pictures, and I and I want my hair to be short. No, I want it to be long. No, I want it to be this. And they're trying to be like a million different things, and they're not happy with the result because they're asking for 
things that are in conflict with each other. And then at the end of the day, they walk out and they're not happy. But it's it's not really because of necessarily the work. It was because they kind of came in and it wasn't like their request wasn't a good fit for what their results were going to be. And so for I, I know this is a really long kind of twisted way around this, but there are places and times when you get into this and if this is going to create anxiety and um, just stress and be unpleasant uh, to it's even just sitting down and recording is a good a good commitment a good amount of time that you have to and if it's miserable that's going to come across and people are going to hear that and so that's not going to work right yeah um, but but I'll say outside of those kind of limited circumstances, I'm a little biased because I'm a huge believer in the medium. Yeah. But I think the the numbers bear it out too. Is there's a reason that audio grows year after year? There's a reason yeah. that every time we see those charts, it's a staircase. Yeah. Is people want audio? That's yeah. why audiobooks have gotten so popular. And the reason they have, and the thing that drew me in immediately and made me believe in this and made me change my career di direction is audio does what no other form of marketing can do. It sells you time. Uh, it doesn't say stop and read, stop and watch. Yeah. It says, what are you doing? I'm coming with you. Because right this second, somebody's in their car listening to us. Yep. Somebody's on the treadmill, somebody's walking their dog. Yes. And they don't, we're not asking them to divert their attention from the task. We are giving them information, helping them learn, perhaps even entertaining them a little bit yeah. while they're also doing the thing they want to do. Oh, that I think is that's, one of the reasons it's grown. That's amazing. And I like this idea of I'm coming with you because uh, oftentimes it's all of those tasks that you described, whether they're on the treadmill or sitting in traffic, it's a, a moment that is less than pleasant. And so it's like, okay, let's just make it a little better. <laughs> let's bring right. something in, music or I mean, a how, podcast or whatever. And how frequently have you been listening to a podcast and you're you're driving somewhere and then traffic clears up and you get where you're going faster and you're like i could have used some more time i need 10 minutes <laughs> i would like to finish this <laughs> yes yeah. exactly that like is you kind the of reason... bring flavor to it exactly that is one of the main reasons aside from people's general attention span that i try to keep these shows in a reasonable amount of time where i feel like it, you can probably get through it in in uh some bad traffic or you know whatever you might right. be doing it's we're not going to drag it on for an hour and a half and ask you to come back a second time I get it. I get it. Everybody's got short is, is short on time these days. Um, okay, so there's a couple of things I want to a uh, couple of questions I want to dig in and, and answer. Let's talk about the the commitment, the time and cost. Very broadly, obviously, it's going to be different for different size firms and whatever their goals are. But roughly, what do you suggest for a firm in terms of how much time? they need to commit. And we're going to assume they're hiring an agency to help manage and um, okay. produce the show, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and time, time and budget kind of go like this. Yeah. If you have, if you have more time than you have budget, then you can spend more time inside the firm doing things. Sure. On the low end, you can find a chop shop to just cut up your audio for probably a few hundred dollars a month. Right. And, and, and they'll just, they'll cut it up. It might not be the most perfect job in the world, but it, it'll be serviceable probably. Yeah. And then you're going to, you know, you will have, you'll upload it and draft show notes for it. Any links, d publish it, distribute it, get it on the website, get, get it on the YouTube. Social media. You, yeah. Right. Getting all of those different pieces together and, and out into the world. And, then on the flip side, if you're a firm that has budget for it and doesn't and wants to use minimal time investment, you know you can have a weekly show where somebody is on a call like this right here, yeah. recording it for you, and you get on, you spend thirty minutes per episode, maybe you hop off and you're done. Yeah, and that's the last you will ever see it. Right, and you're back to practicing law because that's your job. And then it turns into a full length video. It turns into, it's on your website, it's on YouTube, it's on podcast players, it's got show notes and links. It's, it has all of the video clips and quote images and they're all pushed out on social media and you can be looking at 15 or $20,000 a month. Sure. Depending on the frequency of the shows that you're doing and, and how many of these assets that you've got. Yeah. So a lot of firms, you know, I'll say the firms that work with us are, most of them are in the 
five thousand a month range. Sure. Um, you know, five to eight roughly. Uh, the kind of those mid sized firms, and that's you know frequently you can you can get a weekly show there with a yeah. few you know a few different things there. Yeah. So there's, and that one of the things I enjoyed when I started getting into this was there's so many legal marketing agencies out there and people are used to paying for video and yes. SEO. Yes. And so when we start, we, we bring out our rate card. It, it's not shattering people's brains right? because they're used to seeing these 20,000 and $60,000 a month bills. Yeah. And then they see, Oh wow, we can get all of this right. for, for this kind of rate. Yeah. And it makes, it makes, it makes selling a little it bit makes easier. It makes it so much. Yeah. It, and it's so much better because this is unique content. You're not just yeah. chasing a Google algorithm. You're not just kind of throwing out keywords and all of that stuff. You're creating unique content. And, um, the, the laundry list of, of things that have to happen on every single episode in order for it to be really put out to the world correctly is yes. insane. And what I skipped over and we haven't even really talked about is the initial setup of a podcast when done correctly takes forever. And the amount of work, and I have a producer and the amount of work she did in those first few months and the lists, and she uses Trello, oh, and yeah. the lists of everything that needs to be done, there is no way I could have done that on my own. Even if I had decided, okay, I'm gonna take the next six weeks off of all projects, and I'm just gonna focus on right. launching this pro. First of all, why would that make any sense? That makes no sense. Right. And second of all, yuck, like that is not my calling in life. <laughs> but um, I think it's it's important for people to be aware of the amount of work just in the initial setup. Yeah. There's a lot of one-off stuff that has to be that has to happen, and you have to go through these lists. That is an insane list, and and to just recognize and appreciate how much work that part is. And we we have clients that will show up in the middle of that process yeah. because they thought, well, let me see if I can figure this out. And you can, there's oh, a geez. lot of it, so much more information now than there used to be, yeah. but there it's a two part problem is even if somebody handed you the list, like you've got the list of how to launch the show, it's sure. created now. Yeah. Just following that list would be very time intensive to figure out how to follow a written list, but yeah. then they have to go figure out what to do and then deal with what the conflicting information. Yeah of no. what to do and then execute it, which is what I did back in the day learning it. But the difference is I loved it. Yes. Figuring all that stuff out and creating that. And so now we have a process yeah. where, you know, it's about a four week process yeah. that we go through. And that's pretty with, quick. You know, actually. Cover art, voiceover, yeah. soundtracks, getting, getting all it, the things to connected all the to all the other connected things. And I feel right. like that comes full circle because we talked about that mental health point in your career at the beginning of the show and now we're kind of calling, coming full circle to recognizing what you enjoy and i clearly recognize when i decided to launch this podcast that is not what i enjoy kind of like laundry i do not do my own laundry anymore I, and i will like forego many of life's pleasantries to not continue to have to do my laundry um in the future because it's the nicest thing ever i highly recommend it right but along those same lines we talk about this all the time for every type of expertise there is in marketing in the same reason that you say to your clients why they need to hire you for your legal expertise you need to not be going out and trying to diy your podcast or diy your marketing or diy your oil change or whatever it might be you you know you need to hire the experts to get it done right for the same reason you're telling your clients why they need to hire you as the expert and not go out to legal zoom and do their own legal work right yeah well, and it, it, to me it comes back to what's your goal yes if if you have a goal of growing a firm and practicing law and perhaps growing a firm to a point where you don't have to practice law then every decision you make should be in line with that. Yep. And I, it's hard for me to see a scenario where you would take your time, whether you're billing 300, 500, 800 an hour and think I'm going to do this. I'm going to spend this time. Yes. <laughs> so even on the low end, if you're charging $200 an hour, yeah. um, a, it's going to take you a lot of hours to figure out what an agency knows. Yeah. And you're going to, you know, if you do the math, you're probably coming out 80% behind. Yes. You're going like to waste thousands of dollars. Even with a good agency, yeah. you're going to waste a lot 
of your time that you could have been using to do business development and things that would, would actually drive. Yes. Cause being on the podcast is where you need to be. You need to talk, show up, be there. And, but other than that, like that kind of work is almost always a bad use. And any business owner yes. needs to think like that. Like my business coach that I had years ago told me like, here's, here's the number that, that your hourly time is worth. Yep. And now anytime a task comes through and it's under that number, you can pay somebody less than that number. We have to pay somebody less than that number. Yes. Because your time needs to be spent on things that matter more than this. A hundred percent. And also, that's assuming that you could do it at the same level as that person oh, who's sure. assume, assumedly been doing it for at least a few years, right? So even let's say you think, okay, I'm going to save myself thousands of dollars. I'm going to set up my own podcast. That's assuming you know how to set it up in the same way that people have been setting up podcasts for the last however many years. So the It like almost always sounds bad. It, it sounds bad. The likelihood that it's going to be crappy is very high and you're going to waste a ton of money. Like, why would you do that? Like, it makes no sense. Yeah, it, I'll tell you what it's going to be, and I'm probably going to burn some goodwill with some listeners here, but <laughs> Good, let's do I'll it. take the risk. It's going to be a Blue Yeti yes! in the middle of the conference room table, which is the worst room in your office so to try echoey. to record a podcast. Yes, yes. Sounds and, like you're inside a tin can. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you're going to put down what is not a bad microphone for a sound studio, but a terrible microphone for an echoey place. Yes. And everybody's going to talk into it from way over here. <laughs> and yes. and it's going to sound awful. And then, it, yeah. So can we just so say I've for, listened to a lot of those. I have too. And I will say, so can we just say the Blue Yeti is not the right answer. It's just not a great mic. And it's not what I use. And I will say, before I got on Legal Talk Network... I had a Blue Yeti, and then I talked to them, and they're like, you got to return the Blue Yeti. It's not great. But, but Karin, it's so big and sexy, and yes. I feel like Walter Cronkite when I talk into yes. it. And they have great marketing. They have a great website, and it feels like when you search, that comes up as kind of one of the only answers. Like, they've done a great job of marketing, Yeah, but it's well, not a I great audio file. Like I have audiophile friends that love to go to the mat on this. Yeah. Because they will tell you, no, 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 it is a great no, mic. No, no. But it needs the right environment. Uh, why like bother? Needs, yeah. Well, there, that's the answer. Yeah. Why bother? Yeah. If you are, if you are in your house, buy a dynamic cardioid microphone. Yep. Those two words. Yep. And what the, all that means is it's not going to pick up nearly as much echo. It's not going to be nearly as sensitive and it's going to pick up just what's right here in front of it for the most part. Exactly. And so you're going to get for home studios. That's, that's what you need. And a lot of them are USB. You can get some for 60, 70 bucks for a good one. Yes. And that's what I ended up getting, um, you know, under advisement after they looked at my, <laughs> my blue Yeti and it's so much better. And I will say for the average listener, the way I describe it is it sounds like NPR. Like you sound all of a sudden, like you're just in that nice, warm mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, exactly. All that ASMR sort of sound. And it's yeah. so much better than the blue Yeti. So if you get nothing else from this episode, just know that Blue Yeti is not the great, the greatest. Like it's okay, it'll do the job, but it won't sorry, sound great. Sorry, Blue. Yeah. I think they're doing fine. <laughs> they're okay. They are more than fine. Okay, so it is time for the book review. So what is? I, I know you've got a good one, and we actually didn't talk about this beforehand, which is, is good because then we kind of leave the conversation for when we're actually recording, and it's more mysterious. So what's the book that you have for to recommend for the audience today? Well, so I'm um, what I'm reading right now, and. Uh, I, 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 we'll see how much benefit other people get out of it. It's called Pricing Creativity. Ooh. And it's just about uh, doing creative work, which I think legal work very much falls into that for Ooh. a lot of lawyers. But it's about pricing. It's about pricing yourself for value instead of pricing yourself. I, I know lawyers, uh, a lot of lawyers want to get away from pricing themselves for time. Yes. Because it's, you've, people will always say, well, $500 an hour is absurd. Well, you're not pay paying me $500 for that hour. Right. You're paying me $500 for that hour and for the 20 years it took for me to be able to do what I just did for you in an hour. Exactly. And, yeah. and people, it can be hard for people to wrap their head around that. Yeah. And for me, I want to price things in a way that says, how much value are you going to get from this? Yeah. Because if I could tell someone, hey, I can, you can get $50,000 of value out of this and I'm going to charge you 15 
they're going to do that yeah, every time. Exactly. 100 out of 100. Well, and the and, idea of pricing things hourly, it rewards the lazy, slow worker. The person who's just going right. to continue to do it at that just rate, hours. not learn anything, not get any faster, not ha- expedite or improve their systems. And so the people who do improve and get faster or whatever are, di- are, are dinged for working faster if they continue to work at an hourly rate. So it makes no sense. If you're good at what you do, yeah. you should not want to work at an hourly rate. Uh, and so why, tell me why you think lawyers are um, in the creative field. I find that interesting. Well, so, so much of what happens. So having been, you know, I practiced for almost seven years. Yeah. People walk into your office and they start spinning a tail. And yes. your mind starts going. Yeah. And you've never heard this specific scenario before. And now you have to think through an analysis of like, okay, this is connected. This is connected. <laughs> and in one, in the first moment you think, oh, they're screwed. Yeah. Like the, and, but then you think again, you go, but what if, and you crack a book and you look here nice. and, and you're pulling all of these different things together to try to craft a compelling argument. Yeah that will perhaps win over a fact finder. And I find that I I didn't think it at the time while I was doing it because when I was up until the time I was 35 and I kind of went in this direction, I had a narrative about myself was I'm not creative. Yes. That's what I told myself. Yeah. I can't draw. I'm not very good at music. I'm not creative, right. which is bananas. I write marketing copy now that is used by some of the top firms in the world. I'm highly creative, Yeah. but I didn't understand that at the time. Yeah. And, but now when I look through this different lens, I was doing a lot of creative work then. Sure. And a lot of lawyers are, is finding unique solutions to complex problems. Yes, yes, yes. That no one has solved just that way before. Yeah, I think that's really valuable. I think, um, and even for, for myself, I started my marketing career in design. And so as a designer, I never thought of myself as a creative either because I think a lot of us start out with these small boxes of what we define creativity. It's only the stuff you see in a museum. It's only paintings and sculptures and like people who have a very, very narrow definition of being, being an artist, which is not the same as being creative. And so when you were describing like that, 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 that scene of the, of the client and I'm picturing the, that kind of crazy person who takes the, the, um, pins in the wall and connects the strings and whatever, but being creative is being Charlie Kelly. Yeah. Well, or like Homeland. I don't know if you ever watched Homeland, but I loved (laughs) Homeland. I lived in Charlotte for a while. So we'd see him filming. Nice. Um, but being creative is being a little, what people define as sort of crazy, like thinking weird, thinking different and trying to make those kinds of connections. And that's creative. It doesn't have to be, um, a sculpture. (laughs) That's, that's one way, but there's a lot of other ways. I think that's really valuable to, for people to think about it in those terms that you're going to find a creative answer for these solutions, for these issues and that your clients are coming to you for. So, all right. So let's, what's, uh, sorry, I was just kind of got just distracted in that left turn of the creativity idea. Okay. So that's the book, the book review. We will link to the book review on the show notes. Um, but Robert, what is one big takeaway that you'd like people to get from this episode? Aside from the blue Yeti. (laughs) Um, first you can be anything you want. I love it. I think that like, I'm telling you it's, it it really is true. And I've met a lot of lawyers. I do mental health CLEs now and lawyers email me and they say, I feel like you gave me permission. Yes. And and that's what I I want people to know because not everybody is built for law just because you spent all the money and you spent all the time. Like sunk cost is not real. Yes. And, and there's, and what I found out the hard way, like when I left law, I went and got a job in corporate just to pay the bills while I built this. Yeah. On day one, they paid me so much more money than I was making in law. (laughs) And the work was so much easier. Yes. Yeah. I think that's kind of some of the sad, um, sad reality of the legal industry for a lot of lawyers. Because, you know, there's, there's this vision that we all have of what we see in TV shows and movies. And it's like, okay, that's not real. (laughs) I mean, maybe there's a couple that are, that turn out that way. Okay. So number one, you can be anything you want. What was the other, did you have a second takeaway? I mean, I have millions, but you have to stop me. (laughs) Okay. It sounded like you had a list. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, when you're leaning into podcasting, one of the things I think you can do that will allow you to be successful is bring yourself to it. Don't yes. put on your don't put on your lawyer voice. Uh, look at all the thousands of books I own. They don't care about no. that. They care about their problem and how you're going to help them solve it. And it's your job to become relatable to them. Bring yourself to it. Talk to them conversationally. Let them know who you are yeah. because that's going to give them the right feeling about whether or not you are the right person or not the right person, equally yeah. important. Yeah, I think as much as I, as much time as I spent talking about, like not talking about your cats, I think your advice was much better is, yeah, it's not bad to talk about your cat, but sprinkle it, pepper it in. <laughs> Just, oh yeah. You know, make it part of your seconds, personality. You know? yeah. I've got a cat and I've got a funny story about my cat that relates yeah. to this topic. It's not just out of left field. <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with one more book too, because I think yes. it was the one that I sent you when I was on here. It's called, they ask you answer. What's that? If you're looking for content ideas. Yes. Oh yeah. What is this? So I get this question so many times is what will I talk about? Yes. And if you're, if you are the kind of firm that could benefit from doing an FAQ style, they ask you answer is an incredible book and it just takes you through the framework of identifying the content. You will never run out of content. Once you read that book, you re once you read the first chapter of that book, it will shift the way you think about creating content. Oh, I love it. And you'll, you'll realize you'll never run out. I like that because I do think people need to think of this podcast that they're thinking about in terms of it being a massive part of their content uh, marketing strategy. And as soon as you start doing that, then all of a sudden it's, it's, it makes sense and you can kind of budget for it. You plan for it. You've got the topics and all that stuff. You throw this book in and you're good to go. <laughs> and also don't forget the team because <laughs> you're not going to do it by yourself. You shouldn't be doing it by yourself. <laughs> Awesome. I love it. All right. Well, Robert Ingalls is the founder of Law Pods. And we, that was such a great conversation. Thank you for all of that. Super helpful, super useful information about podcasting, why you might not want to do it or might not be a great fit for you. But then all the other good stuff about if you're going to do this, here's how you do it. Here's the mic not to use. And here's some things you need to consider in the whole planning process. So thanks for being here. That was an awesome conversation. It was such a pleasure. I love it. Any moment somebody will put a mic in my face and let me be the person to talk, I'll take it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the CouncilCast podcast. Be sure to visit our website at council-cast.com for the resources mentioned on the episode and to give us your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate it if you could rate and review the podcast on Apple and subscribe to your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next one.